Hi, I'm Chad Dorsey. I'm president of the Concord Consortium. We're a nonprofit research and development organization in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, before I start, I want to, on behalf of the speakers and those who have been involved in the wiki and everything, thank Sherry and Jeremy and Judy and Patty for the tireless work that's gone into this day. It's been absolutely amazing, and it's only because of their efforts. <laughs> So, wow, this is all amazing stuff that we've been seeing today. It's actually hard to believe the things we talked about a couple years ago at conferences seem mundane in retrospect. And after all these great individual examples, I'm here today to remind us about the big picture. See, we stand today at a critical juncture. We have the capability to completely redefine the future of education. At this time and in this room, we have many of the minds and the resources needed to bring about this transition. But before I talk more about this and how we need to go about it, I have to tell a brief story about my childhood. You see, I grew up in Minnesota. Yes, that Minnesota, the one with sweet corn, with hot dish, with butter sculptures of beauty queens. <laughs> and now anyone who's heard Garrison Keillor knows that Minnesotans can talk. So every family visit I remember was bracketed on both sides by 30, 45 minutes sometimes of conversation about transportation. How'd you get here? I took 35, 35, 218 is faster, but it's 77 if you take the cut up. You get the idea. Now why am I talking about this? Because this is a really hard problem. It's one that used to seem impossible. Remember the traveling salesman problem? Bubble sort al algorithms? Now it's almost completely gone. Get in, press home, drive. <laughs> now, it's a little known fact that this problem had been addressed before. So I brought along some advanced technology to demonstrate. Remember this? <laughs> I had to search to find one. But I want to prove to you that this is advanced technology. See, it has expandable full screen capability. It has interactive zoom features. And it even has built in search capabilities. Now, this is extremely advanced technology. It's something that's been with us for a long time. But it's been almost completely supplanted in no time at all. And with it, the role of one static maps has fundamentally changed as well. Today, our maps dynamically show us where we are right now. That's a subtle but immense shift. We can focus entirely on our current location and on the context that surrounds us and adjust accordingly. That tiny blue dot represents a huge transformation. A similar level of transformation is poised to happen in learning. And I brought along another old technology that needs reconsidering. You might recognize this. It's an old technology that has about 1,114 pages and over 800 vocabulary terms. Now, textbooks are actually a pretty important technology. And they're one that serves an important role. It's a critical object for education. And it represents another very hard problem. Now, that serves some very important functions. Teachers need central objects of learning. We can't expect them to search out and assemble resources into intricate progressions. States and others need them too. They need them to audit something for quality. They need them to help structure time. Those needs exist no matter what. So we need textbooks, the concept they represent, as a scaffold for ourselves moving forward. But these central objects need to transform as radically as maps have transformed. Unfortunately, today's stabs barely scratch the surface of that. Now, PDFs with simple highlighting capabilities, social media capabilities are a start, but they're only that. And publishers' interactive examples are steeped in print paradigms. Now, some of this is limited by the capabilities of technology, but much more of it is limited by imagination and lack of resolve. We need to move far past transmissionist pedagogy and static cookbook learning. We must involve students in inquiry, 
expose them to engineering, and deliver the deluge of data in ways that make the deepest possible use of technology for learning. We need much more. Models and simulations need to weave virtual experiments seamlessly throughout STEM learning. Probes and sensors need to be everywhere to unlock the invisible mysteries surrounding us. Technology needs to dump a whole class's data into a single graph as they collect it, rocketing past carbon copy experiments to reproduce into analysis. Formative assessment needs to be everywhere, telling teachers where students are on their journey in through learning at, in real time, and telling them how to adjust instruction accordingly. We're working toward all this at the Concord Consortium, and everybody out there, everything you've seen today, makes up the elements of deeply digital learning. We've defined seven different aspects of this, and I'm sure there are a few we've missed, but it's the combination of all these things that we'll require, and that combination is much more than the sum of the parts. This will make learning something unimaginably new. Students will explore massive nuanced simulations as scientists publishing and debating findings. A half million teachers will crowdsource data with student results to make massively tailored curricula. This is essential, and it's, it's within reach, but it's still impossible with what we have now. In 1957, two American physicists, William Geyer and George Weifenbach, looked up at the sky. Sputnik had just launched, and they realized that they looked up that there must be a way to determine its location. This was the spark that led to GPS. Now, the vision was straightforward, but the path and the need was obvious, but the path was anything but clear. It ultimately took the combination of a critical moment in time, the Cold War, and a massive federal investment to bring to reality the amazing, life-changing, often life-saving system that we know today. Private companies weren't going to make this occur, and if they'd tried, it never would have had today's openness. I love this quote. Anything the internet hasn't changed yet, just wait. <laughs> We've seen this happen over and over. The music industry, it tipped in years. Entertainment and news aren't taking much longer. Every single one of you in this room will be part of the education revolution. The question is just whether you'll be driving it or following it. The stage is completely set for this transformation. But the window is tiny, and the change needed is huge. If we don't seize this opportunity and boost it with a momentous and well-timed federal investment, the best stuff won't be included, and we will squander an unthinkable opportunity shortchanging generations to come. But isn't this already happening? Aren't we already funding it? Hey, in this room, out there, you, we, are building great stuff. We're linking it together. We're aiming for the skies. But we've only got glimmers today and glimmers don't outfit districts. People buy into what's easy, into what's in front of them, and that's what will end up in front of students when the dust settles. They need the absolute best that we in technology can provide, and we're not funding that vision yet. Like, we're not even funding its pieces nearly enough. Now, there's solid thinking here, solid thinking across agencies that puts forth a clear call. So now is the time to heed it. This is not a time for feeble investments. This is not a time for baby steps. The time is here and now for significant programs, for sweeping efforts, for new ways of thinking. We need to be bold. We need to seize this moment because it's rapidly passing over the horizon. And it could represent the grandest of missed opportunities. So first, we must get serious about funding the development of deeply digital learning. We need to transcend our patchwork of small experiments. It may be a surprise to people in this room, but the serving size for fundamental educational change is not the two-week chunk. <laughs> now, we need something big, visible, useful examples that move quickly into real practice. Deeply digital curricula that cover whole courses and domains. The core of STEM could be covered in six courses or fewer. Double that to make a variety of options, constructed all over a period of four to five years. Convene the best people set a clear charge, a dogmatic one even, and fund it right. So let's take a number. Say $200 million a year. This is less than 6% of our $3.4 billion annually for STEM education. If the Department of Education and NSF are combined, it's barely 5% of that share. And we've already seen how a creative match in private foundations can cut that in half. Even across a mere handful of years, this would bring a permanent and transformative shift in education as we know it. Is this not a goal worthy of 1 40th 
of our outlay federally for STEM education over the next four or five years? By the way, there's already precedent. We have a massive effort going on um, for a multi-year assessment development effort at a similar price. So worried about backlash from taking on large-scale curricula? Make this a multi-agency call. Build on current successes, partner with private groups, learn from the Department of Ed's learning registry, the Gates Foundation's strategic learning initiative, for example, but keep control and keep the agenda focused so the mistakes of the past aren't repeated. Second, provide a platform. Make it open by requirement. Push interoperability to a new level. Right now, we're funding islands of innovation that are continually sinking back into the ocean years after we complete them. A solid set of starting curricula, a firm operating platform. We connect these individual investments instantly and bring them, leap them into classrooms as a living set of extendable building blocks. Finally, support teachers to the hilt. This technological revolution lives or dies on their backs. Without them, we've got nothing. And by the way, defining the role of the teacher in the deeply digital classroom is one of the major and unrecognized challenges of our day. Fund professional development to help teachers navigate this unfamiliar landscape and propagate the models far and wide. So everybody in this room here has an opportunity, and everyone has a role to play. Innovators, keep on building great stuff, but do it by banding together fiercely. Thought leaders, influencers, don't settle for shallow innovation. Don't lay back and allow circumstances to deliver less than we all know is possible. And federal funders, realize the power of this moment and be bold. Commit to ensuring that funded work truly makes a difference and lives on for generations. One of the most critical junctures in the development of the internet came in 1985. A patchwork of individualized networks sat unlinked across the nation. The potential, if they were linked, was obvious, but their future stood as eminently unclear. And quantum links, soon to become AOL, had just begun to network Commodore 64 computers across the country in its own closed network. Now, AOL wasn't going to link these existing networks. It was too big a job. And this story could have a very different ending than it does. Think walled gardens. Think about today's mobile providers and that patchwork. However, that same year, something called NSFNet launched, providing a boost of funding and coordination almost solely responsible for the innovative and open internet that we have today. We face a problem right now that is truly as big as GPS, as far-reaching as the internet, interstate highway system, and as wide as the internet. And it's one that is more important than all of these combined. It's the education of our youth, the preparation for tomorrow. Nobody else is going to solve this problem in the way it needs to be solved. And the alternative, sitting back and waiting for a patchwork of shallow solutions to arrive, is unacceptable. So I urge you all to take the lessons from today, go out, and do your part to define the deeply digital future. Thanks. <laughs>